Welcome to our 16th episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. You're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. So it's our sweet 16, huh? Sweet 16 already. Holy cow, where'd the time go? We have just been having so much fun and we've gotten so much support from everybody. We just are so grateful. And like I said, we're not going anywhere. We have tons more tanks to talk about. We are planning some big trips for this summer. What's one of the places that you were wanting to go up in Indiana? I think we're going to go yeah, see the, uh, up to the Indiana Military Museum. Yeah. In Vincennes, Indiana, I believe is the name of the town. So uh, be definitely watching our Facebook uh, posts because we'll, when we get up there, we're going to do a Facebook Live. And you'll see me rolling around on the little Japanese tank. Going, yeah. Oh, it's, was, oh, it's so great. Oh, Charlie and the <laughs> little Japanese. live tanks. Yeah. Hmm. I know. It, it's like the lightning when she gets a hold of the catnip. She just falls in love with it and rolls just around. Just rolls around all over it. Yep. Um, we did have a question uh, from uh, one of our listeners about lightning and if she was declawed. And, yes, she's front declawed, but that's how we, or that's how Russ rescued her. Um, if you don't know, uh, lightning was a rescue. She had been declawed. And uh, we're not debating whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But we just fell in love with Lightning and didn't care if she had claws or not. Yeah. So. Yeah. She's been an incredible cat. Pretty good companion around here. and Like I said. Cheap best, entertainment. Best 20 bucks you ever spent. It definitely is that. Talk about our Patreon. Yeah. Help us out, guys. Support us. Check us out on Patreon. Go to www.patreon.com. Dot com. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and that's www.patreon.com backslash two tankers and cat. And that will be our Patreon page. Now, if you're not familiar with Patreon, uh, it's, it's very secure. Don't worry about, you know, putting your credit card thing out there. Patreon does a really good job. And uh, basically what Patreon does is gives you special access to stuff that we really don't put out except for our Patreon users. Um, this could be drone footage of certain tanks, basically interviews or reports from my daughter all over the world, going to museums, uh, tank museums, and explaining tanks. And you can actually see that my daughter looks nothing like me. Yeah. <laughs> She's beautiful. I'm a troll. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where Charlie got his weird looks, but yeah. <laughs> my weird looks is they found me underneath a rock. <laughs> Everybody says, your daughter is so beautiful. And I said, yeah, as soon as I find that milkman, I'm going to beat the crap out of oh. <laughs> Um But our main thing that we wanted to say is we have done what was the best tank on the Western Front. Everybody knows it was the M4 Sherman. And everybody came out pretty much in support of that. Then the IS-2, the JS-2, being the best tank on the Eastern Front, People were like, oh, I did get some hate mail about that. You know, the T-34, the best, the best, best. And uh, it's like the one guy on Facebook messaged me, and he says, uh, T-34 was the best. How can you say that IS-2 was the best? And I'm like, well, pretty easy. After Stalin had to move the tanks or tank factories over the Ural Mountains, they were trying to lightning you <laughs> crazy cat. <laughs> This cat is running room from room at 90 miles an hour. I well, mean, she's probably about two pounds lighter. I think she just used the litter box. I think that's why she's running in circles. <laughs> she's trying to air dry. <laughs> oh, people tune in to listen to you know us talk about tanks, and we're end up talking about her using a litter box. We're, we're, we're glad you're laughing with us, folks. Oh, please and do. And if you're not laughing with us, feel free to laugh at us. There you go. <laughs> We were talking about the T-34, and we are going to do an episode in the T-34, and I do not hate the T-34. I love the T-34. Oh, I absolutely love the T-34 myself. But In-game, uh, anyway. Yeah, and I, I love looking at them. You yeah. know, it, it, it was a great design. It, it was just a great tank, and I'm not saying anything negative against it. But like I was saying, if you look at the factories that were taken over to the Ural Mountains, they did a study of how long you know, these tanks were going to last, how many combat hours that it was going to last. And if you'll research it and you you dig up the archives, 
These T-34s were only expected to have 16 hours, or 14 to 16 hours of combat life. Now, the Sherman, they built that thing to go and go and well, go. Well, sure, yeah. And the IS-2, Germans couldn't shoot through it. We forgot to put in that uh, IS-2 episode, and I wanted to bring this up, that uh, Guderian, the German tank general, they flat out, you know, he put out an order, do not engage the IS-2 one-on-one. In fact, don't engage it if you see it. Back off, go get a bunch of help, infantry, artillery, and then attack these IS-2s. Don't attack them one-on-one. Now, this is a German general, you know, Guderian, who wrote so many books and, and was in charge of, like, the whole Panzer thing. And he's telling his boys, do not engage this tank. There's, they're right there. When a German general says, do not engage this tank, we can't beat it. That puts you in the... That's saying quite a bit, yes. That, that puts you in the running for the best tank on the Eastern Front. I agree. But everybody keeps coming. What was the best tank of World War II? I guess the best way to do it is the tank that you like the best. You as an individual. There you go. It, it, that's going to be the best tank. There you go. You know... If you love the Vickers, or if you love the Crusaders, or you loved any of these tankettes, the Italian tankettes. Hey, don't knock my tankettes. I apologize. I forgot Russ is a big tankette fan. Because they are cool, you know. Unique. Yeah. But if you want to look at it strategically and not tactically, what was the best tank of World War II? We're going to try to build a case for the Panzer III. Everybody's going to, are you kidding the Panzer III. Let's get into this. Uh, I'm going to try to make a case for it, in which we believe, uh, personally believe, the most deserving title of the best tank of World War II. Go ahead, Rust. Now, first of all, the Panzer III very much fulfills the strategic requirements of the German army. And moreover, it was involved in some of the most spectacular successes of the entire war. Overall, tank kill ratios were 7 to 1 in Germany's favor in 1941, and that's quoted from Zaloga's Red Army Handbook. And that was even despite the technical superiority of some types of Russian armor. Uh, for example, the T-34 and the KVs. Now, remember, when we say the kill ratio in 1941 was 7 to 1 compared to these Panzer III's, that's including all the Allied. Now, people say, no, 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 uh, the Panzer III had a 9 to 1 kill ratio. That was on this eastern side the soviet side but with the british tanks and the french tanks and everything all together the whole you know allied tanks against the panzer three it was a seven to one kill ratio which is amazing we're talking about the panzer threes killing everything that it's coming up against including t-34s and kvs and there's nothing wrong with that Uh, even more remarkable are the distances involved it was over a thousand kilometers from the starting point of the barbarossa to the gates of Moscow, and the Panzers covered that distance in less than half a year. Pretty daunting distance that no Allied campaign would ever match. Even the vaunted reliability of the Sherman was never asked to cover that much distance. So we're talking from Barbarossa to the gates of Moscow, but we're also talking, which is, what, a thousand kilometers? But this is also, most of these tanks were traveled from, like, railroads, or from the factories to the railroads, the railroads to the bases and stuff like that. So basically, Berlin to Moscow. These Panzer III's were super reliable. They didn't break down. Just a epitome of German engineering the way it should have been. A good frontal assault tank. After 1943, the Panzer III loses some of its luster uh, to the point that the Panzer III tank is gradually, but not completely, withdrawn from service. Uh, But this ignores the fact that the trusty Panzer III chassis nonetheless remained in service as one of the most successful TDs of the war. And that was the Stug. Here's what everybody doesn't understand. And this is where we're getting a little heated. People are going, no, 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 the Stug wasn't a Panzer III. Yes, it really was the Panzer III's chassis. Basically, they just took the turret off the Panzer III and made it a tank destroyer. If you re- research the Stug, it was it was incredible. Tell us a little bit about the Stug. The Stug vehicle was actually one of the most successful of the entire war. Its low profile meant that it often got the crucial first shot in any engagement, to the point that many Allied commanders actually mistook Stug firing from concealed positions 
as actual tigers or panthers. So these thugs were so low profile and they could camo out and their first shots were usually kill shots. And lightning man oh man she, she is, is on a rip roaring she is deal tonight. Now we know now you know why we named her lightning. She is fast as a dang bolt of lightning and there she comes back. <laughs> Acts like something's chasing her. must be her tail. (laughs) But uh, if we talk about this thug, it was hitting them so hard and from concealment that the people shooting at them were like, oh, my God, that had to be a tiger. It just shot right through us or it's killing us. They thought it was tiger or panthers. The tiger and the panthers are some of the best tanks out there. And people are fooled by these thugs, which are panzer threes. PZ-3s consumed only roughly half the steel needed to make a Tiger or a Panther. No other tank out of the four main contenders ever performed such a smooth transition from a strategic exploitation vehicle to a tactical support vehicle for defensive war while maintaining the same level of dependability and reliability. You know, we, we're going to talk about the Panzer One. And we're going to talk about the Panzer II in different episodes. And we'll even talk about the Panzer IV. Basically, the Panzer III was the first German assault tank, you know, where it would run through uh, enemy lines. And if they did run into a bunker or something tough, they would call up the Panzer IV, which was a bigger tank with a bigger gun. And they'd use that to dig out any bunkers or any pockets of resistance. The Mark IV was never truly able to reach the full mass production levels like its competitors to make it fully suitable for attritional defensive war. In short, the Panzer III was the vehicle that was always at the right place at the right time at the right configuration. It was the reliable exploitation tank during the great early war offensives. It was the dependable support weapon of the late war defensive battles. Little more could have been asked of it. When we're talking about the very beginning, when they first invade the Soviet Union, even when it goes back to an invasion of Poland and stuff like that. But let's go ahead and use the Soviet Union, for example. They had these Panzer Threes leading the attack. And everybody's all like, oh, no, no, no. They had uh, the Jag Tigers and the King Tigers out, out front just shoving through. No, they had these Panzer Threes. The Panzer Kampfwagen Three commonly known as the Panzer III, was a medium tank developed in the 1930s by Germany and was used extensively in World War II. The official German ordnance designation was SD KFZ 141. It was intended to fight other armored fighting vehicles and served alongside and support similar Panzer IV, which was originally designed for infantry to support. And that's what we were just talking about. Uh, The Panzer III was the assault tank. It went in, it was supposed to fight, it was a tank made for tank killing. Go in and kick some ass. Right, absolutely. And when they ran into pockets of resistance, that's when they were supposed to call in the Panzer IV. People say, oh no, the Panzer IV led the tank. No, the Panzer IV was created to be a infantry support. Now, as the war progressed, that role changed. You know, then they, you know, because they start bringing in different tanks, but the Panzer IV turned out to be the workhorse, uh, supposedly. But if you look at the strategic implications and, and the Stug and the other uses, you know, the Panzer III was it. The Panzer III remains famous in tank history because it is associated with the first four years of successes of the German army. The Panzer III's godfather was Heinz Gutierrez, a prolific armored warfare writer and theoretician who envisioned an ideal design for the task of both dealing with other tanks and providing infantry support. Now, here's Heinz Guderian, and if you don't know him, please read some of his books. Heinz Guderian was basically, like they say, or like we're saying, the godfather of the whole Panzer warfare and, and the tanks. And he was just a really, really genius when it came to this stuff, uh, you know, for armored warfare. He envisioned the Panzer III to be his tank. And we're going to get in some more, you know, when it first came out. Uh, we talk about tanks that are modified. We, you know, when I brought up the Sherman, you know, Russ will tell you, oh, yeah, you know, there was a lot of modifications to the M4 Sherman. There was a ton of Panzer III. Uh, there was like the Panzer III A all the way up to the Panzer III N, uh, these different variations, because 
the Germans were listening to their tankers and these tanks, and they were going straight to Heinz Guderian and saying, hey, we need this. Hey, we need to change that. We need to do this. Hey, we're getting hit with this. And they would change it and give it a different from A to B to C to D. But we're going to get into that. His plans were submitted to the inspector for mechanized troops in 1934. However, it was not approved by the Waffenment which was the Ordnance Department, because of the choice of a 50 millimeter gun. The Ordnance Department was indeed satisfied with the 37 millimeter Pac-36, of which large numbers were already in stock. It was already the main infantry support gun, allowing easy ammunition management and standardization. Here's where Guderian's genius is really put up. He's said, okay, this Panzer III, I have to have a 50 millimeter gun on it. Because it's going to be going against anti-tanks. You know, it's going to be... And he knew about the British tanks at the time. And he knew about the French tanks. Um, French tanks at the time were pretty thick. And, and they're, he's wanting these 50 millimeters. And they're like, eh, we're going to give it to you. We're going to give you your tank. But you're going to have to take the 37. Because we have tons of these, you know, 37 pack 36 uh, in stock. And he's like, oh, you don't understand what I'm trying to do. I mean, he sees what's going to be, the, how the war is going to be developing. He's, you know, like an oracle. He's going to see into the future what he's going to need. They made a horrible choice. They gave it a 37, but go ahead, Russ. This short-sighted view proved a major blunder. Numerous pre-series versions appeared in the quest of a suitable suspension. The Panzer Ossif A to C proved under-armed and under-armored. So, Guderian knew that they needed a 50 millimeter. The armor, you know, he probably knew it was going to have to be improved, but you don't need a lot of armor if you're getting the first kill. And with that 50 millimeter, he would have been being able to do a little bit more because the tankers are coming back and say, hey, these 37s are bouncing. Kind of like we did, you know, we we're like, hey, we're going to upgrade to the 76 millimeter. But uh, go ahead and tell us what Guderian did. After Guderian met Hitler in 1939 about his concerns, the 50 millimeter upgrade was again put on the table before the Waffenment, now supported by the Fuhrer. Nevertheless, the Waffenment simply ignored the orders and delayed the upgrade until the Ossif J appeared in 1941. Guderian goes to basically the leader of the country. He goes to Hitler and says, and this is 1939, and he says, I need this 50 millimeter. And the Fuhrer says, you know what? You've explained it to me. I understand what you're talking about. We're going to tell him to do it. He tells him, this is a Fuhrer order and you're going to follow it. They're like, no, no, we're going to keep it. And this delays the upgrade until 1941. And this is going to be a bad, bad thing. The Daimler Benz prototype incorporated a three-seat turret with an intercom system. Uh, both proved very innovative features, the latter being well ahead of its time. Radio was also part of the equipment from the start. And the commander was directly informed by the platoon commander, also easing coordination with other panzers. Now, everybody says, well, what's the big deal about radios? Well, some of the tanks that they were fighting were using flags, where the commander would have to stick his head out, or his body out, and raise a flag to signal the other tank, which meant they had to be looking at the main tank. The Germans didn't do that. They had radios. Uh, they even had an intercom system so they could talk to all the guys in the tank. So people knew what was going on and it increased your response time. And especially if you're a tanker talking to the commander leading the entire platoon, it's definitely coordinating and making things faster. And speed and accuracy on the battlefield equals victory. Yeah, I'm going to bring up, you remember our, one of our first episodes, how they used to communicate with each other on the FT-17? Uh, no. Well, they used to kick each other didn't they oh yeah 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 because <laughs> we made the joke that i, I was the fat kid that yeah. be getting kicked yeah charlie would be the one getting kicked but yeah they come a long way since the yeah. ft-17 so instead of the commander having to come down and kick the driver in the right shoulder or left shoulder <laughs> shoulder to go right or left you know hey. they just used an intercom yeah we laugh about that but that that's german engineering yeah. that's on target. During the fall of 1942, new projects came to completely renew the German armored forces. These was a new generation of tanks, the first of them being the Tiger, followed closely by the Panther, much closer to the modern idea of a perfect main battle tank. Here's where we get into the terminology MBT. And if you hear us using MBT in the future, it's main battle tank. Kadarian knew 
that he was going to need this main battle tank. The Panzer III was, well, even with the, like the Blitzkrieg style of combined arm tactics and a, a lot, you know, that allows tactical superiority, the Panzer III was made for it. Considering this, the 1936 Panzer III was seen as obsolete, at least in its anti-tank role. However, Daimler Benz still found a way to improve its old battle-hardened tank. They mounted a deep wading exhaust for river crossing capabilities on the Asafim, and 250 of those were built until early 1943, and since the beginning fitted with Scherzen, which was armored skirts. We're talking about they're, they're putting on these uh, exhausts, uh, deep wading, they were running into rivers, places where the tigers and panthers couldn't cross. So they were like, uh, "We got to get these tanks across. We got we got to get some kind of armored vehicle back out there." And they're like, "Oh, well, we're just going to put a big long hose, and, and we're going to put it above the engine so it can still suck in and exhaust, and then we can cross these rivers, basically being almost completely submerged." And pop out on the other side. You can't do that with a tiger or a panther. Yeah, it'd be pretty rough. But, but these Panthers threes were going through, proving again that it was so valuable. And you were talking about uh, the armored skirts. People have messaged us before, is that like, why are they putting these armored skirts on? Well, it's basically to stop the high explosive ammunition, also to stop some of the bazooka rounds and stuff like that, shape charges. Uh, also from people just running up the side and throwing you know, explosives or sticking explosives to the side. So these, when you look at the uh, Panzer III, M series. These things had tons of spaced armor. These skirts, 50 millimeter, and uh, I think one of the last versions was in. But yeah, tell us about the N. In. in mid 1943 came the last version, the Ossif N, with a short barreled 75 millimeter KWK 37L slash 24 gun capable of firing for the first time heat projectile. This tank was the perfect dual purpose versatile model which inspired retrofitting of earlier versions. Since new specialized tank hunters and heavy battle tanks were available, the Panzer III was increasingly confined to an infantry support role. So then they upgrade it to the 75 millimeter, I hate to say it, derp gun, kind of like a howitzer, but it was using heat. Uh, when we say heat, that's a high explosive anti-tank round. Uh, and it's really good against machine gun nests, bunkers, and stuff like that. So now these Tigers and Panthers, you know, that are the main battle tanks now that are running off, the Panzer III is still a great infantry support. They're like, hey, uh, we ran into a machine gun nest. We need somebody to go up there and help us. They just go up there and use the 75, you know, with a heat round and derp. That was the end of that. In July 1941, a considerable effort was made by the Germany war industry, and invasion forces were divided between three large armor corps, north, center, and south. These consisted of many new panzer divisions, in fact, made from split former units. These forces mostly counted on panzer threes and panzer fours. We're talking about the north, center, and south armored corps that uh, are going to be pushing in to the Soviet Union. They're using these Panzer III's as the initial tank versus tank and using the Panzer IVs for uh, infantry support. This is the beginning. All Panzer III's were now upgunned to the J-1 standard with a KWK-38 L-42 50mm gun. This gun was sufficient against the tens of thousands of BT-7s and T-26s, which constituted the bulk of the Russian armored forces at that time. When they invaded Poland and some of these North Africa, I believe, they were using the 37. Finally, Guderian gets these all upgunned and everything uh, with the 50 millimeter. Now, when people talk about when the Soviets invaded, they were like, uh, well, where were all these KV-1s and these T-34 tanks? They had them, but not in great supply. The Soviets initially had the BT-7s, which were small light tanks, and the T-26 was a small light tank. They had tens of thousands of these tanks, so when you get these 9 to 1 kill ratios, here's these BT-7s and uh, T-26s that, that had fought in the uh, Sino-Soviet uh, war before World War II, uh, where the Japanese and uh, the Russians kind of had it out. Uh, these BT-7s and T-26 light tanks were great compared, you know, fighting the Japanese tanks. Now 
they come up against these Panzer III's that are the main battle tanks of the Soviets, and they're just shooting right through these things. And when we talk about the the initial, you know, nine to one. Uh, kill ratios. Why was the Panzer III so successful? What the Soviets really had in the beginning, they really didn't have a lot of these T-34s and KV-1s. And they even had, some people say, what about the KV-2? Remember, the Soviets were putting these tanks out there without, you know, troop support. They really didn't have trucks or they didn't have uh, troop transports to move up the artillery that was going to help uh, cover these and infantry. So these Panzer threes were charging in and just annihilating these BT sevens and these T twenty sixes at range. You know the fifty millimeter was a good, accurate. We talk about German accuracy. They were hitting these tanks and then one shot, one kill. They also had the Luftwaffe was right above doing their dive bomb attacks. They So they had air super, superiority. They had the trucks and armored transports and half tracks to bring up their artillery and their infantry. So they had everything working together. And a lot of these Soviet tanks were out there by themselves, uh, you know, and raising flags at each other when the Germans were talking on radios. Panzer threes, when they would find these KV-1s, they'd be I- isolated. So they could literally sit there and shoot at them, bounce off, and then they could call in an airstrike, or they could call in an artillery strike, or they could just wait until it got a little dark and they'd send the infantry up with bazookas because they didn't have the infantry to protect them. The German crews soon discovered that both the KV-1 and the T-34 were immune to their weaponry, even at short range. The last versions of the Panzer III, the Ossif M, and the N had improved protection, better guns, and AP, or armor-piercing ammunition, which were conceived in deal with the latest Russian tanks on the Eastern Front. They were used in successive defensive lines, facing overwhelming forces until the fall of 1944. So they know, uh, again, like we were, you know, hitting on, uh, these German PZ-3 crews, they have the upgunned, up you know, we're talking about the M's and the N's, and, and with the armor-piercing ammunition, but they're still not piercing these tanks or, or sufficiently killing them, one shot, one kill. But they could call in the support that they needed. These KVs and the T-34s would be out by themselves a lot. You know and I know if you can radio back to the airbase and tell the dive bombers to, you know, start dropping bombs on these T-34s and these KV-1s, that's how you're going to kill these tanks. Daimler Benz engineers succeed in mounting the 75mm low-velocity gun on the N version the very last of a long and famous lineage. Production ended in August of 1943. In 1943, heavy tank companies, which at full strength contained 10 Panzer III Ossif Ns for nine Tigers, by then, older surviving Ossif J to M tanks joined the Italian front together with other veteran models, some having fought on since 1941 in Africa. The long barrel, high muzzle velocity guns combined with improved AP charges like tungsten rounds, good use of the rugged terrain, and camouflage by hardened veterans pinned down allied assaults in Italy until the end of 1944. People are like, okay, the allies were really, you know, stopped by the Italian mountains. And that's true. But these veterans with the Panzer III and knew the pros and cons the strengths and the weak the weaknesses of these Panzer threes. They set them up, and they were doing really well. I mean, they like they said they pinned down the assaults in Italy until 1944. By that time, they weren't getting a lot of you know ammunition, fuel, and stuff like that. But they dug these Panzer threes in, and they were like, mm, "You're not coming. To, you're not going to get us out." A few improved Ossif J to M Panzer threes fought in limited numbers in Normandy but their movements were constrained because of Allied air supremacy. However, once again, a good use of the hedgerow proved that the Panzer III was still a match for most Allied tanks. So we're talking back with this whole thing with air superiority. The You know, the Panzer III is, is there in Normandy, and everybody's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, it was, but they couldn't get out and maneuver as much as they could because the Allied planes were shooting these guys left and right. There's stories of tigers and panthers being, you know, trying to hide from uh, allied air superiority because they would just basically 
bomb and kill these tanks. You know, you can say what you want about, you know, a Tiger tank. If it gets dumped on by, you know, an aircraft's bomb, it's going to flip it over and kill it. And, and these Panzers 3s were, you know, they're like, oh, these are the little bitty tanks. And But they stuck these things in the hedgerows. And with the high velocity guns, it, they were still killing allied tanks coming in. They just had to be sneaky and hide in the hedgerows. By the end of 1944, the regular Panzer III were no longer the bulk of the German armored forces. They were spread into composite small defensive units, and as the production had stopped earlier, their numbers decreased even more, and by fall of 1944, there were perhaps 80 still operational on the Eastern Front. Now that's a perfect example. They stopped making a tank that worked, and they were building... How do I say this without sounding like a jerk? The German military at the time were using these big heavy tanks and they could have made two uh, panzer threes upgunned and everything else like that that were you know perfect for the fight but they wanted to make these more heavier more armored thicker tanks when at that time they should have been just putting whatever they could in the field we built 50,000 shermans the soviets had what 58,000 t-34s the production they the or cutting out a tank that worked to build something that really wasn't feasible and was having breakdowns all the time. And these Panzer threes didn't. And this seems to maybe be the area where, like you said, if they would have continued on with the Panzer three at larger numbers, like we did with the M4 Shermans, I mean, maybe Things it would have turned for them. Yeah. You know, you'll get a lot of these historians talking about what if at the beginning of the war, they didn't have that 37, but they had the high velocity. Had the 50 millimeter and above already. Yeah. With these tungsten rounds. Yes. It, things would have been a lot different. We're talking still by the fall of 1944. There's 80 of these Panzer threes that are still operational when everything else is getting killed. The last Panzer threes fought in the Low Countries, Market Garden, Northern Italy, or the Gothic Line, and in Eastern Prussia. Perhaps a handful still operational were spread between desperately weakened companies in March through April of 1945, like the Steiner Brigade. Others were kept inactive in operational reserves in quiet sectors like Norway or Holland until the capitulation. When we talk about the Low Countries, uh, and he mentioned Market Garden, that's Operation Market Market Garden. If you get the chance to see a movie called uh, A Bridge Too Far, it's a great movie. It'll give you a, a little detail of what Market Garden was. The Northern Italy, the Gothic Line, is what we were talking about where the Allies kind of got bogged down because they got these Panzer threes and they dug them in and they couldn't push into these mountains because these little Panzer threes with their high-velocity guns were putting a hurt on everybody. They're like, oh, we're not going to sacrifice or suicide our guys in there. So it basically became a line that they couldn't cross at that time. And Market Garden, same thing. They kind of held it right there. And then, of course, the Eastern Prussia. Other than these... Panzer threes, they left in like Norway and Holland, and they really didn't get into the fight. You know, here's you know places where you didn't need those tanks, and you should have been putting them where you needed to get them. Where you fight. needed them, yes. Go ahead and give us the production history. The Panzer three was designed by Daimler Benz between 1933 and 1937, and it was produced by the same company between 1939 and 1943. There was about 5,774 of them built. We're talking about 5,700 of these built, but that's not including the Stugs. Uh, I know the Stug three. Uh, even though they stopped making the Panzer three, they didn't stop making the chassis. That's, they started making the Stugs, and they made like 8,000 of those. Go ahead with some specifications. The Panzer threes weighed 23 tons, or 25.4 short tons. It was 5.56 meters long, or 18 foot 3 inches, and they were 2.9 meters wide or about 9 foot 6 inches wide. Uh, they were 2.5 meters high about 8 foot 2 inches and it had a crew of 5 and that included a commander, a gunner, a loader, a driver, and a radio operator and a slash bow gunner, machine gunner. Now one of the amazing things about the Panzer 3 and we, we're going to try to post some pictures of the Panzer 3 when we release the episode on Facebook if you get a chance, go look at some of the pictures. When they talk about the crew of five, the commander, 
the gunner and the loader were all in the turret. The driver and the radio operator bow machine gunner was down in the hull of the tank. I guess the Panzer III has a special place in my heart because it had the side doors. And you'll see pictures or old films of them driving down the road. And they got the gunner hanging out one of the side doors of the turret. And the loader hanging out on one side and the commander out through the top. And you're like, wow. That's a really good idea, having side doors. I did notice that, you know, going through some of the research on this. And now that you mentioned that with the side doors, that never really clicked until you just said that. But, yeah, that was pretty interesting to see that they had the side doors on them. Well, another thing about the side doors and the Panzer III, the, the tank, when it did get hit, it was easy to survive. You could get out pretty quick. I mean, the side doors, the hatches, uh, the radio guy, even the driver could get out pretty quick. Uh, tell us about some of the armor. The Asif J through N had 50 millimeters of armor all the way around. Well, you know, they talk about 50 millimeters not being a lot of armor, uh, but that's fairly good armor against, you know, heavy machine gun fire, uh, stuff that you would run into. That's not including the skirting armor. And if you look at some of the pictures yes they did up armor by adding skirts and stuff now i know there were so many variants and so many different main guns but can you do some of the main guns and what variants had what gun the osif a through g had one 3.7 centimeter gun on it the osif f through j had five had a five centimeter gun and the osif j through m had a 5 centimeter KWK-39 gun on it, and the Ossif N had a 7.5 centimeter KWK-37 gun as its main armament. Wow. So, you know what? Like I said, in the beginning, if they'd done what Guderian said, he needed that high velocity uh, 5 centimeter uh, or 15 millimeter uh, high velocity gun, if they'd made it Panzer III M at the beginning, it would have been a different war. I agree, 100%. Well, tell us about the secondary arm. Yeah, they all had three 7.92 millimeter machine guns as their secondary armament. Now, I know the Tank Museum, I, I saw one of their things that said they actually had two machine guns, but they had three spots for them. They would actually take the loader's machine gun and move it up to the commander when he needed it. But I'm telling you, most of these experienced veteran commanders were snagging an extra machine gun and saying, hey, we're getting as much armament as we can. The commander usually had some rank and he's like, hey, I need a machine gun. So that's why we're saying three. I know a lot of people say, no, it only came with two. It had three mountings, and most of the pictures that you see, it had three machine guns on it. Uh, tell us about the engine. Yeah, the engine was a 12-cylinder Maybach HL120 TRM engine. Yeah, it had 300 horsepower of power and a power-to-weight ratio of 12 horsepower per ton. The suspension included a torsion bar suspension, and the tank had a fuel capacity of 300 to 320 liters. Now, with 300, you know, liters of fuel, what was their operational range? The operational range was about 165 kilometers or about 103 miles. Wow. Not too bad. It's got a great suspension. It's got the, like you said, the torsion bar suspension. It's got a great engine. It's that Maybach uh, 12-cylinder. For, you know, a small tank like the Panzer III, that's a really good motor. And, it, you know, operational range... You know, for only 300 liters of gas, 103, pulling that around with full load and machine guns and crew and everything, that, that's pretty good. What kind of speed was it kicking out? Yeah, it had a road speed of about 40 kilometers an hour, which figures out to about 25 miles per hour. And off-road, it got about 20 kilometers an hour or 12 miles per hour. Now, again, I, I've done the experiment of uh, trying to do 12 to 25 miles an hour off-road to you know be able to fire anything machine gun or a regular gun lord it's tough yeah those tanks were beating you to death you know believe it or not they didn't have you know air conditioning and you know tilted seats <laughs> definitely didn't have our current day shock absorbers like we've got on our cars today yeah so 25 miles an hour uh, on the road pretty good speed it is uh, did Japanese do anything with the Panzer III? Yeah, the Japanese government actually bought two Panzer III's from their German allies during the war. 
Uh, one of those particular tanks had the 50 millimeter gun and the other one had the 75 millimeter. Now, why gun. would the Japanese buy Panzer threes? Well, they plan to reverse engineering. Ah, since the Japanese uh, put more emphasis on development of new military aircraft and naval technology and had been dependent on European influence in designing new tanks. So they're like, okay, we have our tanks, but these Panzer threes, they fit us pretty good. And they said, we want one with the 50 and one with the 75. So they started stripping those down. Can you imagine if they started doing that from like oh, 1930? I know. I, I, I don't think people would be laughing at the Japanese I tanks. I would agree, yes. Well, Russell, tell us about some of the combat history. The Panzer III was used in the German campaigns in Poland, in France, in the Soviet Union, and in North Africa. Many were still in combat service against the Western Allied forces in 1944 through 1945. At Anzio in Italy, in Normandy, and in Operation Market Garden in the Netherlands. A sizable number of Panzer III's also remained as armored reserves in German-occupied Norway, and some saw action alongside Panzer IVs in the Lapland War against Finland in the fall of 1944. In both the Polish and French campaigns, the Panzer III formed a small part of the German armor forces. Only a few hundred Panzer III Ossoff A's to F's were available in these two campaigns, with most being armed with the 37mm main gun. They were the best medium tank available to the German military at this period of time. The Panzer III also saw service in Northern Africa with Erwin Rommel's renowned Africa Corps. Most of the Panzer III's with the Africa Corps were equipped with the KWK 38L 42 50mm, which was a short, short-barreled tank gun. Uh, with a small number possessing the older 37mm main gun of ver- earlier variants. The Panzer III's of Rommel's troops were capable of fighting against British Crusader cruiser and U.S. supplied M3 Stuart light tanks with positive outcomes. So, again, here's Rommel going into North Africa, and he's stuck with these 37mm guns, but he's still beating up these crusader tanks and if you uh haven't we've actually done an episode on the uh, crusader if you haven't listened to it go back and listen to it and uh it was killing them and they uh, we supplied them with the m3 stewards and uh i personally am going to do an episode on the steward but the m5 variant the m3 i, I did not like that tank I, I i don't even like considering it a tank it was more of a armored reconnaissance car with tracks i guess so the panzer threes of rommel's troops were capable of fighting against british crusader cruisers and u.s supplied m3 stuart light tanks with positive outcomes although they did less effectively against matilda II infantry tanks and the american m3 lee or grant tanks fielded uh, m3 by, lee 10 foot, I, I 10 foot tall and I know. <laughs> we mentioned that tank once again man it was it was there it was there <laughs> With a huge silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> Ten foot tall. So these Panzer threes were having a really tough time against the Matilda II, which is, if you don't know the Matilda II, it's an armored brick. They used to call it the Queen of the Desert. It was slow and everything, but man, it had tons of armor, and you could sit there and shoot at it and bounce. And the American Lee Grants, uh, they, they were... <laughs> putting a hurting they were uh they had the 75 gun that could shoot ap and he and uh they were doing pretty good in particular the 75 millimeter hole mounted gun of the lee and grant tank could easily destroy a pander three far beyond the latter's own effective firing range as is true for the u.s m4 sherman which also saw service with british forces alongside lees and grants in north africa beginning in the middle of 1942 Right. People say, oh, well, Operation Torch, you know, Rommel just destroyed, you know, the Shermans and the Lees and the Grants, you know, the, the Americans were driving. And I'm like, well, sort of. He didn't do it with Panzer Threes. He did it with concealed uh, 88s. And we were just getting into the war and we charged straight towards these 88s with terrible losses on our side. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, the Russian operations. 
or uh, Soviets. I apologize. The Operation Barbarossa in the summer of 1941, the Panzer III was numerically the most important German tank on the front line. At this time period, the majority of the available tanks, including rearmed Ossif E's and F's, plus new Ossif G and H models for the invading German military, had the 50 millimeter KWK 38L42 50 millimeter cannon, which also equipped the majority of the Panzer III's fighting in North Africa. Uh, initially, the Panzer III's were significantly outclassed by the more advanced Soviet T-34 medium and KV series of heavy tanks, the former of which was gradually encountered in greater numbers by the German forces as the invasion progressed. Again, you can kind of see what's happening. Uh, it was great against the Crusaders, and, and, you know, the British Crusaders and the M3 Stuarts. Uh, it was really great against the Soviets, BT-7s and the T-26s. But now, here come the big boys. They've upgunned, they're bringing their main battle tanks, the Sherman, the the T-34s, the KVs. And they're like, wait a minute. This, this tank's not cut out for this kind of battle against these guys. Now, they still had huge successes. But they were also had the Luftwaffe, they had air superiority, or they had the 88s, you know, anti aircraft guns shooting at them. And they, you know, had radios. They could, like we were talking, they could support each other and, and get information out and had big time wins. Okay, Russ, we're running late on time and I, I want to be able to touch about the Stug, the Stug 3. Um, I know people are going to go, well, you're saying Stug, but it's actually called Sturm Gusserl's Lock. I can't ever say it. I just say <laughs> Stug 3. Uh, I know people make fun of me, and there's you know a ton of people uh, like Craig Moore and, and Rob. They're like, really? You, you've been a tank fan for all ever since you were a little kid, and you still can't say Sturm Geisters? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I can't. So it, it's a Stug. But tell us about the Stug, which is the Panzer III. Yeah, the Stug III assault gun was Germany's second most produced armored fighting vehicle during World War II after the SD KFZ 251 half-track. It was built on the chassis of the proven Panzer III tank, replacing the turret with an armored fixed superstructure mounting a more powerful gun. Uh, initially intended as a mobile assault gun for direct fire support for infantry, the Stug 3 was continually modified, was employed as a tank destroyer. So, get us a little bit into the production history. The Stug 3 cost approximately 82,500 Reichmarks. There was about 10,000 of them built. They weighed 23 or almost 24 tons. They were 6.85 meters long or 22 feet 6 inches long and 2.95 meters wide, almost 10 feet wide. They were 2.16 meters high, almost 7 foot high. So very compact, low silhouette tank. What kind of crew did it have? It had a crew of four. It had a driver, a commander, a gunner, and a loader. So a lot smaller crew than your Panzer III. Panzer III, yeah. Well, I think that's because they had to put the bigger gun that they were using, um, and you're going to tell us about the gun here in a second, but... They put it where the bow gunner and uh, radio guy used to be. What kind of armor are we talking about? It had 16 to 80 millimeters of armor. Uh, that comes out to about 0.62 inches to 3.15 inches of armor. The main armament on the Stug 3 mm. was one 7.5 centimeter STUK 40L slash 48. And they carried about 54 rounds of ammunition with them. Now, I know the second ar armament was uh, just one of the... They only had one machine gun. How many rounds did that thing carry? They carried about 600 rounds of machine gun ammunition with them. So not a lot of machine gun. Basically, they, they were supposed to just sit there and hide and shoot whatever popped in. Because they had 54 rounds. That's a lot of rounds. Yeah. But they weren't ready for, you know, fighting on the front lines with this one machine gun with 600 rounds. What kind of engine transmission? Yeah, it had a Maybach HL120 TRM uh, V12 gasoline engine. 
and it drove a six-speed transmission. So we really don't need to go over the other stats, you know, because pretty it was, similar to it, the Panzer III stats. Well, it was the Panzer down. III, yeah, yeah, exactly. You might have a little bit less gas and a little bit less speed or something like that because of bigger gun. Just incredible uh, that they built ten thousand of these, and you said it was the second most produced. Again, here's a perfect example of Panzer III. Yeah, I think there's even stories and people that will debate that uh, the Stug III killed more enemy tanks than any other German tank out there. Well, Russ, I know, and people are going to debate this too, there was at least 200 of these Panzer III's that fell into Soviet hands uh, following the defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad. And uh, a lot of these Panzer III's were just sitting there in good shape, and the Soviets decided to keep these, but not to use them as tanks, but to upgun them and use them. I, even in our game, uh, World of Tanks, this tank was called the SU-76I. So when you see these tanks in game, and they're really rare, rare I've got one, it's a SU-76I, that is basically just a Panzer III. And the Soviets are using 200 of these things, these tank destroyers, because they knew the Panzer III was a great tank. So they're like, uh, we have to use these chassis. So tell us a little bit about the 76i. The SU-76i, and the I stands for foreign in Russian, was created in March of 1943 on the basis of the captured German Stug III and Panzer III vehicles and featured the Soviet 76mm F-34 gun. I do like this Soviet 76 gun. It was, it was killing a lot of things. So they captured these Stugs and these... Panzer threes and ripped off the tops and put on their tops and, and we're using these 76 millimeter guns. Did it participate in any combat actions? Yeah, the SU 76 I participated in combat actions until the summer of 1944 and was used for training purposes until the end of the war. The original SU 76 model had several flaws. They were unreliable and not a pleasure to drive so much so that the Soviet tankers named it the bitch. <laughs> you know, I've heard that, that the Soviets did not like their 76 because it broke down and it was so hard to work on. So they're like, okay, we'll give you these 76 eyes, which are just Panzer threes. And then they fell in love with it. The SU 76 I self propelled gun was in some ways better than the SU 76 standard version. It had better armor with 35 millimeter of frontal plate armor. 25 on the sides and about 15 millimeters on the back. The SU-76I handled very well and was popular with its crews, despite its original heritage. See, another Soviet, like, hey, we can't say we like these tanks, but man, this 76I is nice. You know, <laughs> it's got a great gun. It's got radios. We don't have to stick our heads out and start doing flag things. <laughs> Um, and the specifications are pretty much the same, except the, I mean, except the gun. Yeah, the you main know. armament gun. What kind of uh, main gun did it have? It had the 76.2 millimeter, or comes out to about 3 inch, S1 gun, and they carried about 48 pieces of ammunition with it. Wow. So there's Soviet technology. They're like, okay, we've got all these captured Panzer threes. Our guys really like them. Let's put a 76 on there. Hmm. Kind of same 76 as the M4 Sherman? No, no, no. Uh, right. <laughs> well, the Soviets did like the 76, even though we didn't. They were like, hey, give it to this. Well, Russell, we've made a pretty good arg argument. The Panzer III, beginning of the war, uh, it had tons of success. It really did. A and we've proved that it was reliable and it worked good and that there was tons of ways to modify it. Uh, even turn it into a tank destroyer. Yeah, not even for the German tanks, but even the Soviets used it as a tank destroyer. I gotta say, the Panzer III was probably the best tank of World War II. Why don't you go ahead and wrap up, Russell? Yeah, as always, you can contact us through email, twotankersandcat at gmail.com. And we have had several people here lately contact us that way and ask us some questions and and comment and everything, and we invite you, all you folks out there, to do that. You can also contact us through Facebook. Go to Facebook, 
And in the search bar, put in Two Tankers and Cat Podcast. Repeating Two Tankers and Cat Podcast. Search for that, and our Facebook page will pop up there. And we do put a lot of information and, and links and pictures and everything when we release these episodes. We put a lot of information on, on our Facebook page. Yeah, and a lot of pictures of lightning. Oh, yes. <laughs> she's, she's becoming kind of famous. Yep. A tanker cat. A tanker cat. Uh, our website is still www.twotankersandcat.com. Yes, that is correct. Twotankersandcat.com. And we told them how important our Patreon oh, is. Oh, yes. Go out there and, and help support our podcast so we can continue bringing all this cool information. And, and just that'd be very much appreciated if you could just go out and, and look at that page and, and see what all the extra content that you can get on there by helping support us. Definitely. Well, until next time, this is Charlie. And this is Russell. And as always, happy tanking and have a great day.